Perhaps when you look at trees and forests, you think of lumber and the hundreds of important ways that wood serves us. But the forest has other values. Fallen leaves build priceless topsoil, and the creeping, interlacing roots below keep this soil from washing away. Like a huge green blanket, the forest absorbs rain and snow and releases water gradually so that mountain streams are clear and can supply continuously the vast amounts of water needed by our growing cities. And from these cities, millions of people find in the forest true recreation. Once upon a time, New York State was nearly all covered with seemingly endless forests there were three principal forest regions. First in the Adirondacks and Catskills, the northern spruce fir forest dominated the highest mountain slopes in mixture with white birch and a few other species. Today, these mountains are still heavily forested and not only do they furnish clear water, but also the kind of vacations needed by the people of the most populated state in the Union. To visit the dwarfed, wind-swept trees near the tops of these mountains is like going far north into Labrador. Here the mountain climber is rewarded by vast reaches of forest stretching to the horizon. Second, as we leave the high mountains, the spruces and balsam fir become fewer. With white pine and hemlock, spruces and fir are found along the great northern hardwood forest composed mainly of sugar maple, yellow birch, and beech. This hardwood forest of maple, birch, and beech still covers much of the hilly country and lower mountain slopes throughout the state and is an important lumber producing area. The third chief forest region is found along Lake Ontario and in the Hudson and other river valleys where oak and hickory, together with other species, grew in a dense hardwood forest. This region is now mostly farmland, but scattered woodlots still furnish valuable timber to the farmer. Even today, about one-third of New York State is forested. Now let us see a few of the many trees which together make up our forest wealth. Of the softwoods, including white pine, spruce, and balsam fir, the white pine reigned as king all through the early history of the Northeast, towering to a maximum height of over 200 feet, and with a diameter of four to six feet, it produced the finest of soft, durable wood. White pine in smaller sizes continues to be one of our most important timber trees. High aloft on the top branches are the cones which release tiny winged seeds. From such a height, the seeds carried by the wind may sail many yards from the parent tree. Watch them landing like parachute jumpers, and perhaps covered by a few pine needles, the seeds wait for the warmth of spring. Seeds are never-ending miracles. Each one is already a tiny plant with a stem, leaves and a root, all enclosed in protective seed coats. In some trees, the seed coats are left behind in the soil, but those of the pines are usually carried aloft by the young trees, and you can witness the struggle of birth as the seed leaves, or cotyledons, form a sort of basket and finally push off the protective, but now hampering shell. are dozens of little pines, one year old, in a nursery bed. Two or three years later, they begin to grow rapidly, and each spring the young tree develops a new whorl of side branches. All pines have needles in bundles fastened together where they join the twig. But white pine is the only one having needles in fives. Our Iroquois Indians knew this and adopted white pine to represent the five nations. The hemlock is another of our common evergreen trees, but unlike the others, its tip is gracefully arched 
and often points northeast away from the prevailing wind. Hemlock is an attractive ornamental tree and makes excellent hedges. At Christmas, spruce and balsam fir trees bring a woodsy odor into our homes. Unlike the arching hemlock, both the spruce on the left and the balsam fir on the right stand stiff and straight. The spruce usually has four-sided sharp needles. If you roll one of these needles between thumb and forefinger, you can feel the edges. Balsam fir has flat leaves, usually rounded at the ends. But the easiest way to separate spruce from balsam is to look at the dead twigs where the needles have fallen. On spruce, notice the hundreds of tiny pegs where the leaves grew. Balsam fir has tiny round flat scars, no pegs. Many thousands of northern white cedar or arbovitae trees are planted around our homes and branches may be woven into attractive wreaths at Christmas time. The leaves of the white cedar are extremely small, like tiny green fish scales, and are borne in pairs, giving a braided appearance to the twig. Our broad-leaved trees, including hickory, maple, ash, and many others, lose their leaves in autumn and remain bare all winter. But with no leaves, the branch patterns and crown shapes often tell us the name of a tree, even at some distance. Can you recognize the spreading branches of this tree? This is the American elm, one of our most used and admired street trees. White oak has a rounded crown and a hickory can often be identified by its oblong shape. In the woods, close spacing usually restricts crown shape, but there is still another feature with us the year round, the bark. Those big red oaks at close range show a distinctive color and pattern, unlike that of other trees. Entirely different is the gray checkered bark of the white oak, one of our most valuable species. Here is a tulip tree. Moving over the bark surface is something like flying over rough country with a definite pattern of ridges and valleys below. White ash bark shows still another pattern featured by diamond-shaped valleys marked by interlacing ridges. Now let's turn the calendar back a few weeks to watch the amazing process by which the tree sheds its leaves, leaves that will be killed by freezing weather. Where the leaf stem joins the twig, there is a special layer. It forms cork on the twig side and loose, weak tissue on the side toward the leaf. Finally, the weakened layer ruptures and the leaf sails away, leaving the corky covering of the leaf scar, which prevents loss of moisture from the twig. Hickory leaf scars often look like tiny gargoyle faces, and the similarity is even more striking in butternut, where each twig is a miniature totem pole. Besides leaf scars, each twig displays several buds, which are actually tiny telescoped branches covered over with protecting scales. If you look at them with a pocket lens, you can see great differences in form and color. This one is shagbark hickory. And here is red oak. Notice that instead of one bud on the end, there are several, each with many tiny scales. Entirely different are the stubby ends of the white ash. And the buds of sugar maple are again different, so that trees have plain marks of identification even at their very fingertips. 
And so through the winter, the forest sleeps with its millions of buds containing new branches, leaves, and flowers, waiting each day as the sun climbs higher to melt more quickly the fallen snow. And as the days lengthen, the air warms and the buds begin to swell. Some trees, like the American elm, have buds of two sizes. The small pointed ones contain only leaves, and the larger rounded ones are packed tightly with tiny flowers. Most people have never seen the flowers of an elm tree. So here they are, shown by time-lapse photography, in which several days' growth is compressed into a few seconds on the screen. At extreme close range, you can see the stamens emerging. The change from flower to fruit takes place rapidly. And within three or four weeks, these oval discs enclosing the seeds are nearly ready to take off and sail many yards away from the parent tree. Sometimes the wind collects thousands of them along curbstones, and wherever there is enough moisture, you will find them sprouting and growing. Most tree seeds mature in autumn and usually wait until spring to germinate. But those of the American elm are ready to sprout almost as soon as released in May. Again, time-lapse photography permits us to see several days' growth in a few seconds. Stored energy in the seed leaves, or cotyledons, must keep the little tree growing until it develops mature leaves for making new food. These are the buds of red oak. They contain not only leaves, but also miniature flowers. The male flowers are born in long strings, but the female flowers are so extremely small that they are hidden by the leaves. Soon the spring woods are whitened by the flowering dogwood. You may think this is one flower, but actually it is a whole cluster of them. And what look like four petals are really the expanded bud scales. Now we can see the real flowers in the center as they pop open, one at a time, in a sort of chain reaction. Sugar maple buds are also swelling. Soon the scales part and the new leaves come cascading out. Leaves are marvelous factories where water from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air are linked together by the magic of green chlorophyll and the sun's rays to form sugars, the building units of the tree body and all other green plants. If this process in the green leaf were to stop, we and all other animal life on Earth would soon starve to death. Veins are the pipelines of the leaf, carrying water and sugars. Every three to five years, the sugar maples put on a special display of yellow flowers, which come pouring from the buds in untold thousands. They hang on long, slender, thread-like stems and sway to the slightest breeze. During the few days before the new expanding leaves hide the flowers, they give a canary yellow mantle to nearly every sugar maple for miles around. Here are flowers of the American beech. And these are the southern redbud, widely planted in the northeast. The sycamore has its tiny flowers born in compact heads. And even the lowly choke cherry is covered with white racemes. Hundreds of these beautiful cup-shaped flowers give the tulip tree its name. 
and where this species is plentiful, beekeepers recognize the distinctive odor and taste of tulip tree honey. As spring advances, we see new twig tips on side branches of the pines. At first, they stand erect so that they look like candles on a Christmas tree. And if we look closely, we can see the tiny red female flowers of the pine. It takes two years for a fertilized female flower to grow and mature into a pine cone. On separate branches of the pine tree are thousands of male flowers, ready to shed pollen when the branches are shaken or moved by the wind. New York State has nearly 90 different kinds of native trees, and many others have been introduced from other parts of the United States and foreign countries. To the collector, leaves offer a never-ending source of pleasure, since no two have ever been found exactly alike. Perhaps you would like to start a leaf collection. A leaf is called simple, if it has a single blade like that of the red oak, and compound if it is divided into several leaflets or little leaves, like this one of the white ash. Let's look at several tree groups with simple leaves. Here are four common oaks. Those with pointed tips are called red oaks. Those with rounded tips, white oaks. Norway maple from Europe is a commonly planted street tree. The other three kinds are natives of New York State. Certain poplars are also called cottonwoods and others aspens. These four all have flat stems, a rare feature in our native trees. Let's visit the tree from which this leaf was collected and see how it got the name quaking or trembling aspen. The flat leaf stem not only allows the slightest breeze to move the leaf, but also promotes amusing wobbles and other antics. Some people say the tree is laughing with its thousands of green tongues in motion. Anyway, it seems very much alive. So the summer passes, and perhaps some fall morning when you look outdoors, you will see the first trees changing color. Autumn brings fruits, like these beech nuts, or the winged keys of the sugar maple. The acorns of the red oak, which have taken two years to become full-sized and mature. The red clusters of the sumac that yield an acid drink, something like lemonade. The paddle-shaped fruits of the ash, now ready to be airborne. the ball-shaped clusters of the sycamore, and the erect, cone-like fruits of the tulip tree, about to separate into winged, airborne seeds. Now the hand of the master artist fashions in our northern woodlands a spectacle of form and color found only in a few other places in the entire world. As the dying leaves lose their green color, the yellow pigment hidden by green chlorophyll now appears. Reds and purples also develop, especially in trees such as the sassafras, sumacs, maples and oaks, most of which have either abundant sugar or tannin. Finally, autumn gales roar through the nearly bare crowns. The wind tears away the last brown leaves which join their companions on the ground as they dance and rustle through the woods. Each day, the sun sets farther to the south as winter approaches. And so, by the ceaseless cycle of the seasons, Winter comes once more to the woods.
But if winter comes, we can be certain that the spring portraits of trees will soon brighten and inspire our lives and cause us to marvel at the eternal forces of nature.